Christ's deity. It is a, a simple matter of biblical teaching that the one that was born of Mary was both human because he had a human mother and was divine because he had a divine father. The deity of Christ is absolutely essential. You can't be saved unless you believe it, not simply unless it's true, unless you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, is God. Uh, you cannot be uh, saved and believe in your heart. So I want to talk about the biblical basis, uh, the statements in the early creeds, uh, the doctrinal importance of this, some unorthodox views, and then answer some objections. Uh, let's uh, look, first of all, at the biblical basis. A lot of people don't know that the deity of Christ is taught in the Old Testament. There are Old Testament passages that proclaim this, and I want to take a look at several of those uh, Old Testament passages. First of all, in Psalm 2, verse 7, the Lord, every time you see capital L-O-R-D in the Old Testament, that's the word for Yahweh, and it always means God. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. So here's God, the Father, talking to God, the Son, right there in the Old Testament. Several times in the Old Testament, you have one person of the Trinity, usually the Father, talking to the Son. The Lord said, you are my son. Psalm 45, 6. This one is quoted in Hebrews 1, 8. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now, this is the Father talking to the Son. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Therefore, God, even your God. This is God talking to God. God the Father talking to God the Son. Uh, and that word Elohim usually means God in the Old Testament. Third, Psalm 110. Jesus quoted this in Matthew 22. The Lord... Yahweh said to my Lord, and remember this is what he stumped him with, uh, how can the Messiah be the son of David if uh, uh, David, uh, Messiah, was his Lord? How can David say, uh, you are my Lord, when he was uh, David's son? Well, because he's both God and man. The Lord said to my Lord, that's Yahweh, said to Adonai, the Father said to the Son, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Uh, there are other passages. Proverbs 30, verse 4. If you're uh, doing evangelism with Jewish people, this is a good verse to remember. Ask them this. What is his name? What is God's name? And what is his son's name, if you know? God has a son. Uh, and it says uh, so right in Psalm 2 and Proverbs 30, verse 4. Then the great Christmas passage. His name, the Messiah, will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity. Translate usually Everlasting Father, but it means Father of Eternity. Four couplets there. Two of them refer to uh, Christ's deity. Prince of Peace, uh, the other one uh, with the ellipses. So Mighty God and Father of Eternity, the Messiah. Isaiah 63, verses 7 and 9. The Lord, Yahweh has bestowed upon us, and the angel, the messenger of his presence, saved them. The Lord and the messenger of the Lord, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, always refers to Christ in pre-incarnate angelic form, appearing and disappearing for certain uh, purposes. So there again, Father and Son. And by the way, later in that passage, it refers to the Holy Spirit. You have all members of the Trinity mentioned there. Zechariah 1.12 the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts. Now, how do we know the angel of the Lord is the Lord? Exodus 3, 5, uh, 15, verse 14, actually. Uh, when Moses said, What's your name? Uh, he said, I am. <coughs> so the angel of the Lord was the Lord. Now here in this passage, <coughs> excuse me, the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts. So he's talking to the God, the Son, is talking to God the Father. Uh, Dario, would you give me a glass of water? Thank you. <coughs> Zechariah. Where is it? Can you walk on water too? <laughs> Can you turn this into wine? <laughs> wow, that's... Oh, it was you. <laughs> you turned it into. Uh, 
That's great. Terrific. Zechariah 12, uh, 10. This one is quoted in, twice in the New Testament. John 19 and Revelation 1. And the Lord, Yahweh, uh, will pour out on the house of David the spirit of grace that they will look on me, the Lord, whom they have pierced. The Lord uh, is piercing the Lord. The Father is piercing the Son. And it says they looked on him whom they have pierced after Jesus was crucified. And uh, John 19 quotes that uh, verse. And then Revelation 1, 9, or 1, 7 says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, they also who pierced him. Uh, first and second coming, both. So here have two members of the Trinity speaking again. Zechariah 14, 6. All the nations which come, which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, talking about the millennium. When the Messiah comes, the millennium will be inaugurated by celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. And here, the Lord of hosts is the Messiah, and all the nations shall go up from year to year to worship him, the King, the Lord of hosts. So there in the Old Testament we have uh, claims. In the New Testament we have claims that Christ is deity. He claimed to be the I am of Exodus 3.14. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Now that's bad English, but good theology. It should say, before Abraham was, I was. Uh, but before Abraham was, he is the I am. The ever-living, ever-present, self-existent one. And they, you remember, fell back. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am the I am. John 8:58. And Mark 2. Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven to you. And the scribes replied, Who can forgive sins but God alone? Uh, Jesus had a way of making covert claims as well as overt claims. This is more of a covert one. He, he just said, hey, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees standing by said, wait a minute, only God can do that. Oh, uh, he's claiming to be God. Number three, he claimed he should be honored just as the Father. All should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. John 5, 23. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. Now, that's a pretty bold claim. He said, if you honor God, you should honor me. If you don't honor me, you're not honoring uh, God the Father. Three ways he claimed to be God. Four, he said he was the Jewish Messiah who was God. Now, we already looked at those passages. The Jewish Messiah is going to be God. Jesus said, I'm the Jewish Messiah. Therefore, he's claiming to be uh, God. Where did he say that? The woman at the well. Remember the Samaritan woman? Uh, she said, I know the Messiah is coming. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Explicit claim to be the Jewish Messiah who was God. Or on Mark 14, remember when the, he was before the high priest, the high said, I adjure you uh, before the living God, tell us, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? And he said, uh, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest said, What further need do we have of witness? You've heard blasphemy. The high priest knew he ripped his garments because this man was blaspheming according to the law. He was claiming to be God. So at his trial under oath, Jesus said he was God. Five, he accepted worship on numerous occasions which is due only to God. This is one of the powerful indications that Jesus claimed to be God. On nine separate occasions, Jesus accepted worship. Now remember this, the Bible forbids worship of anyone but God. Uh, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me, both in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. Humans refused worship. Remember Paul refused worship in Acts chapter 14? They, they thought he, he was... Uh, uh, some Greek god and the Barnabas who was with him. And he said, no, no, I, I'm not, uh, God, don't worship us. Angels also refused worship. You remember John fell down at the foot of the angel who came to him with the revelation of the book of Revelation. And John just fell down at his feet to worship God, not to worship the angel. And the angel said, don't even, don't fall down before me if you're going to worship God. 
go somewhere else, but don't, don't fall down before me. Uh, worship God alone. But Jesus accepted worship in this context, in this Jewish monotheistic context, that nobody but the supreme God and creator of the universe is God. Jesus accepted worship on nine different occasions. Therefore, Jesus is claiming to be God. He accepted worship from the mother of James and John, Matthew 20, verse 20. From the Gerasene demoniac, Mark 5, 6. From the blind man, John 9, 38. He accepted worship from Doubting Thomas, who said, My Lord and my God. From the woman at the tomb in Matthew 28, 9. The Canaanite woman, Matthew 15, 25. His disciples worshipped him, Mark 14, 33. A healed leper uh, came back and worshipped him. He healed ten and one came back, Matthew 8, 2. And the rich young ruler. Uh, who worshipped him in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. Now, if you can only worship God, and they didn't even worship in the presence of an angel, and Jesus accepted worship on nine occasions, he is accepting the acclamation of God. Now, notice, he never once rebuked anyone. I mean, if a human being uh, falls down at the feet of another human being and starts to worship them, and the other human being doesn't rebuke them, then the other human being uh, is uh, either an egomaniac uh, or totally out of it. He even commended them on two occasions. He never rebuked a single person, but he commended them on two occasions. He commended, uh, you remember, Peter when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And he commended uh, Thomas, in John chapter 20, when Thomas worshipped him, he said uh, to Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And then he commended uh, Thomas when he said, Blessed are you, but well, you've seen and believed, but how about those who haven't seen and uh, yet b will believe? Christ uh, put his words on the level with God's. You recall in the Sermon on the Mount, it says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. Not a jot or tittle. Well, Jesus used the same phrase in Matthew 24 of his words. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Putting his words on the same level with those of God. He that rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. Jesus claimed to be God in six ways. Seven. He asked his disciples to pray to him. Suppose you went to a, a prayer conference and there's a great speaker at the prayer conference. And at the end of the conference, he says to you, Now, from now on, when you go home, if you want to really be effective in your prayer, and uh, let's say his name was John, just, just pray, Heavenly Father, and then to close your prayer, just say, In John's name, uh, Amen. You say, this guy's kooky. You know, this guy is blaspheming. That's what Jesus did. He said in uh, John 14, 13, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Okay, what it is, just ask in my name, and it will be granted to you. Number seven. Number eight. Jesus accepted the titles of deity. Now, everyone in that culture knew the words that applied only to God. People applied them to him, and he accepted them. He accepted, do you remember, uh, in John chapter 20, verse 28, when Thomas said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Thomas, for seeing that. Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon bar -Jonah. He accepted the titles of deity. Other claims for his deity. Not only did the Old Testament claim that the Messiah would be God, Jesus claimed he was God, but other people that he taught also claimed that he was God. God himself said he is God. Remember, three times during Jesus' life, once at his baptism in Matthew 3, once in John 12, kind of in the middle of his uh, ministry, 
And uh, once on the Mount of Transfiguration, three times, uh, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son. God himself spoke from heaven three times. Angels claimed that he was God. When his birth was announced, he will be called great and will be called the Son of the Highest. We're told in Luke 1, 32. That Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Luke 1, 35. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. All of those, the angels claimed. God claimed he was God. The angels claimed he was God. The demons claimed that he was God. This is interesting. What have you to do with, uh, what have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come to torment us before our time? They know where they're going. You say, well, if they know where they're going, why are they doing all this? Well, they want to drag as many people as they can with them. Uh, they know they're going to be tormented in hell. They knew Jesus was the Son of God. And they ask him, are you come to torment us before our time? Now, what's interesting is the demons know more than liberals do. Liberal theologians don't think he's God. They don't think he's the Son of God. They don't think he's virgin born. Ask a demon. <laughs> they, they'll tell you. Thomas, doubting Thomas, my Lord and my God. John 20, 28. He's a doubter. Uh, Jesus had disciples who were doubters. Is it wrong to doubt? Read Gary Habermas's book, Dealing with Doubt. Everybody has doubt. If, if you don't have doubt, you're not honest. Because you can't be sure of everything. And so you're going to doubt some things. And there's an, a neat little prayer in the Bible. I think it's in Mark chapter 9. It says, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So doubt your doubts and be sure of your certainties, but don't doubt uh, what you're sure of. Humans acknowledge Matthew, his disciple, said he was God and talked about in Matthew 3.16 that he was the Son of God. And John and Matthew 16 and Matthew 28 listed him with the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mark proclaimed him to be God. Mark 2 who can forgive sins. Mark 14, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Luke claimed him to be God. The verses we just quoted uh, about the angels. Luke is affirming this. Luke 1 uh, and Luke chapter 2. John claimed that he's God. Look at these verses. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. What a proclamation of his deity. First verse of John. Before Abraham was, I am. My Lord and my God, John 8 and John 20. Peter, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter. Now, that takes care of uh, most of the New Testament except from the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul repeated over and over. Here's a very powerful verse, Romans 9, 5. Christ, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Christ is God over all, eternally blessed. 9.5 Paul also said in Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the great God and our Savior. Great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He also declared, for by him all things were created, all things were created through him and for him. He's before all things and in him all things are held together, Colossians 1.16. Is that a proclamation of his deity? And he was the greatest opponent, the greatest skeptic, agnostic about Christianity in the early church. And he was converted and said things like this. For in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. In Jesus Christ all the fullness of deity dwells in human form, Colossians Two, nine. The writer of Hebrews, Christ being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Jesus of Nazareth, that man that walked up and down the streets of Jerusalem holding the universe up by the word of his power. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. 
For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that uh, Jesus is Michael the Archangel, a created being. How could he be Michael the Archangel when he created all the angels? He can't be a creature if you created all of the angels. You are my son. When he again brings his firstborn in the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Hebrews uh, 1 6. Angels wouldn't be worshiping another angel. You can only worship God. But the Son says, Your th- to the Son, he says, that's the Father talking to the Son, quoting Psalm 45 we gave before, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. God talking to God, the writer of the Hebrews. Now, the Old Testament says he's God, Jesus said he's God. Uh, God said he was God, the angels said he was God, the demons said he was God, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the writers of the New Testament says he's God. Well, it's mind-boggling when you look at the evidence to think that anyone could look at the New Testament and not think Jesus was God. It's just mind-boggling in light of all that. And the early fathers saw this. Look what they said in the Apostles' Creed. Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. His deity was proclaimed immediately by his followers and was put in creedal form starting in the second century. Here's the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. Of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. And then they read in the bottom, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. I was speaking at the Episcopal School to the eighth graders downtown, uh, quite uh, liberal in their theology, Somebody got me in to talk to him about Christianity being unique and Jesus being the only way. So it'll probably be my last invitation, uh, along with the first one. And uh, after the headmaster who was sitting in the class, after he said, uh, now, uh, do the Muslims have any stories in the Quran? I said, no, no, it's not many stories. It's just mostly sermons. He said, that's what's unique about Christianity. We got stories. I said, yeah, and they're true. <laughs> like the story of Jesus dying and rising from the dead. Uh, we got stories. I mean, that's all, that's all he had. They used to believe in the creeds. You know, it's in the prayer book, but uh, they don't believe in them anymore. Chalcedonian Creed, 451. Following then the Holy Fathers, we unite in teaching all men to confess the one and only Son of our Lord Jesus Christ, the selfsame one, is perfect both in deity and in humanness. He is of the same reality as God as far as his deity is concerned. Next read, before time began, he was begotten of the Father with respect to his deity and was eventually conceived of Mary, who is the God-bearer. She gave birth to a person who was God, Jesus, from all eternity. Now, the Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholics... Anglicans and Protestants all accept these creeds because these are the orthodox creeds. These are the things that unite us in essentials, unity. Third, the doctrinal importance. Why is it so important that Jesus is God? Well, one, uh, he has to be God to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. Uh, He has to be God because the Messiah was going to be God. Uh, and Jesus must be God in order to fulfill these predictions. If the Old Testament predicted the Messiah was going to be God, all verses we looked at, and Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, verses we also observed, then Jesus must be God in order to fulfill the Old Testament. If he doesn't, if he isn't God, he can't fulfill those predictions. Secondly, to manifest deity. The Word was God, and the Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace 
and truth. John 14, 9, Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father, because I am of the same essence of God the Father. He also, it also says, God was manifest in the flesh. That's an early creed in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Great is the mystery of our religion. God was manifest in the flesh, seen of angels, preached on the world, received up into glory. Third reason he has to be God, in order to redeem humanity. He has to be God to fulfill prophecy. He has to be God uh, to manifest deity in human form. Otherwise, uh, how would we know what God was like unless he was one of us? Jesus is the mediator between God and man. For there's one God and one go-between between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. To mediate between God and man, you have to be both God and man. Jesus is the redeemer of God, or the reconciler of God and man. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It was Jesus that brought the two of us together. Therefore, Jesus must be both God and man to be the mediator and reconciler of us, which he is. So three very important reasons for the deity of Christ. Look at this uh, visual. God, we have in the blue, man in brown for earthly. Jesus is the God-man. Because only God, man, can bridge between God and man. And the only bridge ever built between heaven and earth was shaped like a cross. That's the only way you're going to get from one side to the other is through that cross that, all, that bridged it. As God, he could reach to God. As man, he could reach to man. And as a God-man, he could bring God and man together. Otherwise, we get alienation because we've rebelled against him. We're sinners. We're rebels. And unless Jesus can mediate there will be no bridge. Now, some unorthodox views regarding the deity of Christ. In the early church, there were heresies. There were heretics. Why did God allow them? He allowed them so that the doctrines that Christians believe could be sharpened. Because every one of the creeds is built on there being some heretic who denied something. And they said, oh, no. That's not what we believe. The negative is sometimes more clear than the positive. Can you imagine the Ten Commandments being in positive form? What would, thou shalt not commit adultery. I would just say that positively. Thou shalt always be faithful to thy wife with respect to thy relationship with other women. How about, don't commit adultery. A lot clearer, right? Right? Uh, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. Very clear. Now, when a heretic comes along, we say, it's not that. It's not that. The historian said, the second person of the Trinity was not Jesus and did not die for our sins. There are two persons, one divine and one human. And it was only the human Jesus that died, not the divine Jesus. Now, the reason this is such a serious heresy is because God didn't die for our sins. The second person of the Godhead didn't die for our sins. So there's no divine person who is dying. You got an extra person there, two persons, and it's just a human person who wasn't the divine person, two persons in Christ. One was God who didn't die and one was human who did die. And that had to be condemned by the church. Another heresy called adoptionism. Jesus was only a man adopted by God. God didn't have a son. And so he saw this very godly man walking around Jerusalem, uh, doing unusual things, and, and uh, he was in tune with God. And so he said, okay, I'll adopt you as my son. And so at his baptism, uh, Jesus was adopted by God and became God's son by adoption. That's a heresy because... If you're God's son, you're always God's son for all eternity. Because the Old Testament passages make it clear. Uh, if you're God, you have to be eternal. Jesus was God. He was eternal. Third heresy called subordinationism. 
the son is subordinate in nature to the father. He is less than fully God. Now, this one is very clever because this one says he's almost God. Now, what, what's almost God? A creature. <laughs> uh, the only thing you have is either a creator or a creature. There's nothing in between. There's nothing almost God. Either Jesus was the creator and existed forever, or he was a creature and had a beginning. So there's no uh, subordinate in nature. The only thing subordinate in nature to a, cre a creator is a creature. And he's not a creature. He is the eternal creator himself. Arianism, modern Jehovah's Witness. The Son is not God, but the first created being. He's not the same as God, he's only like God. So it's very similar to subordinationism. And the early Arians, uh, who were opposed by Athanasius, and the Athanasian Creed came from that, uh, were people who said, well, you know, he, there was a time when he was not. He wasn't eternal, but he goes way back there. He pre-existed, but he wasn't eternal. The Father brought him into existence. And he was the first one that the Father brought into existence, so... He's very much uh, like God. Now, in Greek, there are two words that describe this. Homoousia and homoousia. You know the difference between those two words? One letter. I. Iota. And some people say, oh, you know, you're just splitting hairs. You're, you're arguing about one little letter. You know what one little letter is the difference between? Jesus being God or not God. Homoousia, homoousia. He's not just like God, he is God. He's the same as God. All four heresies. Here's the Jehovah's Witness. He is the first direct creation of Jehovah God. Kingdom is at hand. Jesus was the Son of God, quotes, not God himself. The word, who is he? Jesus was a created spirit being just as angels were spirit beings created by God. Well, that's an utter denial of the deity of Christ. And you can't be saved without the deity of Christ. Why? You have to confess with your mouth, Jesus is God, is Lord, in order to be saved and believe in your heart. Can Jehovah's Witnesses be saved? Not as Jehovah's Witnesses. Not if they believe what Jehovah's Witness is teaching. Is it possible that somebody's in Jehovah's Witness but doesn't believe all that, but really believes that Jesus is God? Yes, yeah, possible. And uh, they're all mixed up. But if you believe what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach, uh, you're on your way to eternal separation from God because it's a denial of one of the 14 fundamentals of the faith. And if some fundamentals are more important than other fundamentals, this is one of the most important ones. Because if Jesus isn't God and man, he can't be our Savior. Answering some objections. Jesus denied he was God. He said to the rich young ruler, after all, don't call me good, only one is good. Isn't he saying, don't call me God? The answer... No, this is not a denial, it's a question. Notice the question mark? Why call me good? He's not saying I'm not good. He's saying, why are you calling me good? Are you calling me God? Are you, are you implying that I'm God? Do you realize what you're saying, young man? Of course, he didn't realize what he was saying. How do we know? Because <laughs> Jesus said, what do you do to get eternal life? He said, keep the commandments. And the man said, oh, I've done this from my youth up. Sure. You have. You haven't even kept the first commandment. Uh, this young man was impetuous, and Jesus stopped him cold in his tracks. Why are you calling me good? Are you saying I'm God? He's not denying he was God. Jesus said, The Father is greater than I. And I can guarantee you, the Jehovah's Witness knock on your door, know this verse, and a lot of Christians don't know it, and they don't know what to say. And you may know a couple verses about Jesus as God. But their translation translates those differently, and they have these verses that most Christians don't know about. The Father is greater than I. Now, how can the Father be greater than Jesus if Jesus is God? He should be equal to the Father. Response, the Father as God is greater than Jesus as man, or the Father is greater in office. I could say my Father is greater than I, but I'm not saying I'm less than human. 
He's human, I'm human. He's 100% human, I'm 100% human. I'm just as human as he is human. But he's still greater in office. He has the office of father and should be respected. And I have the office of son. And his son should honor him. So Jesus is saying, in my office as son, the father is greater than office than me. Uh, Jesus is saying, as a man on earth, the father in heaven as God is greater than I am as man. Jesus said, but of that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Mark 13. No one knows when Jesus is going to come. Even Jesus doesn't. This always amuses me. Hal Lindsey knows. You know. <laughs> Tim LaHaye knows. But Jesus doesn't know. So, something's wrong with this picture. Uh, the angels don't even know when Jesus is coming. Now, if the angels don't know when he's coming... And even Jesus doesn't know when he is coming, then surely all these people who are counting down to Armageddon and 84 reasons why Jesus is going to come in 84 and 85 reasons why he'll come in 85 and 86 reasons why he'll come in 86. You know, after one or two years, they ought to catch on, right? That uh, they're wrong. Uh, I think I may have told you a story before. It's worth repeating. I was preaching at a church in Tampa. That I preached that twice a year for the last 25 years. And there were people in that church who believed that Jesus was coming back in 84. And they had this book, 84 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 80, uh, 84. And they had me scheduled to speak the next Sunday. Now, just think about that. Just think about that. They didn't really believe it, did they? Or else I was going to be preaching to an empty church. So next Sunday I got up, and I must admit, I know them quite well. And I said, I told you so. Uh, Nobody knows the day or the hour, not the sun. But that creates a problem, doesn't it? If God knows everything and Jesus doesn't know something, then how can Jesus be God? Response, Jesus knew the time as God, but not as man. He has two natures. So every time you ask a question of Jesus, remember, you have to ask two questions. As God, did he know everything? Yes. As man, did he know everything? No. As God, did he get hungry? No. As man, did he get hungry? Yes. As God, did he die? No, God can't die. As man, he died, the second person of the Godhead. Jesus knew everything in his divine nature, but Jesus did not know everything in his human nature. He knew everything in the triangle, but he didn't know everything in the circle. Because what does the Bible say? He grew in wisdom and knowledge. Luke 2. He wasn't born knowing the mathematical tables. He wasn't born knowing geometry. Jesus learned everything just like any other human being. As man, he learned. Another objection. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. It's objected that Jesus was, not, was the first one born. After all, it calls him the firstborn. What does that mean? First one to be born. Jehovah's Witnesses know this verse too, but do you know the answer? The term firstborn can mean priority in rank, not priority in time. Why? Because the firstborn is the heir. He's priority in rank over the other children. Priority in rank, not in time. It clearly does so here because he's the creator and sustainer. If in the very next verses, 16 and 17, in the very passage, same author, same context, same passage, he's saying he's the creator of everything and he's the preeminent one, then surely he doesn't take firstborn to mean first one born. When he said he created all creatures, he's not a creature. He is the first over creation, not the first one in creation. Christ is called the beginning of the creation of God. I'll never forget the first time that a Jehovah's Witness stumped me with this one. Because if you're witnessing, you're going to run into these people. And I was a young Christian, and, and I was out witnessing, and I, I uh, had a lot more zeal than knowledge at that time. Probably now i got more knowledge than zeal. Uh, it would be nice to have a balance. But I had a lot more zeal than knowledge at that time. And a Jehovah's Witness opened my Bible and showed me. Right there it says, Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, that means he was the first one created, right? Wrong. This would contradict the clear teaching that 
Jesus created all things. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. So if you have a whole bunch of clear passages that say he created everything, and you have one passage that you're not sure uh, what it means, what do you always do? Take and interpret the unclear ones in the light of the clear ones. Let, let the clear ones help you understand this unclear one. Second, the same term, the same term beginning is used of the Lord, the Almighty, in eight. Of Almighty God. Almighty God is called the beginning. Oh, well, he can't be a creature if Almighty God is called the beginning. It's also used of the Father in Revelation 21, 5, and 6. God the Father is called the beginning. What does it mean? It means the absolute beginning. The beginning, it has no beginning. In the beginning was the Word. That's the beginning that has no beginning, the eternal one. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. Jesus is God. He can't be both God and man at the same time because it's contradictory. He is not both in the same sense. One can be a father and a husband at the same time, but not in the same sense. Jesus can be both God and man without being contradictory because many of us here are husbands and sons or mothers and daughters and yet we're not a mother and a daughter in the same uh, sense. Jesus has both a divine and a human nature. Back to the chart again. He's not the triangle and the circle in the same sense. He's the one person who both has access to the triangle, the divine nature, and the human nature at one and the same time. Divine is not the human. The triangle is not the circle. Jesus had both natures at the same time, but they are not both the same nature any more than the triangle uh, and the